chapter 3, the beginning where it says that Peter and John were at the temple in the hour of prayer, and uh, a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple called Beautiful, and uh, this man is healed, and Peter and John are bringing the word to the people. And then we begin now at chapter 4, verse 1. Let us hear from God's holy, inspired, and infallible word. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day where it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. And on the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all were, who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired by what power or what name do you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all of the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, and by him this man standing before you well, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they had, were uneducated, common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them to not speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened, for the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord, against his anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you appointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. 
while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Let us pray. Father, overcome my stammering lips, my sinful heart, that your people might hear your word. And I ask in Jesus' name, amen. A believer tries to speak on the biblical concept of man and woman before he gets too far He is shouted down by his opponents such that he is unable to finish. The authorities do nothing to silence the rowdies. Another believer seeks to defend the biblical idea of marriage. After refusing to stop in spite of cowbells and catcalls, he is doused with paint. The perpetrator is neither arrested nor charged by the authorities. A protest is held at an abortion clinic. At the same time, unbeknownst to the protesters, the police are ticketing their cars. At another rally, the leader must make an early exit because he is told that the police are after him. They are seeking to arrest him for existing? I guess. Another believer spends almost as much time of his adult life in jail as out of jail for the crime of passing out gospel tracts too close to an abortion clinic. By the way, I was present for those last two events, and the person that I mentioned in the third, I visited him many times in prison. The believers of Acts 4 would well identify with each of these stories since the setting is the same. Cultural opposition to the gospel aided and abetted by those who were in charge by the authorities. Our central question, our central questions are these. Why this opposition? And how are we to to respond? So I'll divide this study into two sections. First, observations from before the prayer, and then two applications from the prayer itself. So let us begin. First, the events before the prayer. What are we to make of this? A, point A, do not for a moment forget that there are powerful forces out who are annoyed at the message of Jesus Christ and would shut us down in a heartbeat if they could. And this offensive message is, this Jesus whom you rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and there is salvation under no other name, under heaven and earth given to men by which we may be saved. Man cannot save himself. No amount of good works will suffice. It is Jesus, only Jesus, only the cross, only his death, only his resurrection, only his ascension. And we trust in that alone. One would think that this message would bring joy to the hearts of people today who are uncertain today, struggling with what does it mean to be a good person. One would think this would bring resounding hallelujahs from every corner of the globe. But it doesn't. Because in the sinful hearts of men, this message is offensive in the extreme. It is seen as bigoted, narrow-minded, primitive, dangerous even. Not long ago, our message might simply have been ignored by people. 
you have your truth, we have ours. Fine, you believe in that Jesus thing over there, but, uh, you know, we choose not to. But today, in this land, which has our president swear, so help me God, at the inauguration, and in this land, in which has, in God we trust on its coinage, and in this land, which sings with gusto at ball game, God bless America, land that I love. I don't believe it for a moment. <laughs> it would wipe out every vestige of the Christian religion and every hint of the name of Jesus Christ, and they think they're doing society a favor by doing so. In their own way, in verse 17, as the verse 17 puts it, they charge us not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. Brethren, you must be aware that perhaps today, more than any other time in recent memory, in this land that we love, opposition to the gospel is certain. It is on the rise. Paul will later remind us in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that all who live godly in Christ will be persecuted. And did not Jesus tell us that the kingdom is for those who have been persecuted because of righteousness, brothers and sisters throughout all the world know this full well. Is it now our turn? Is it now our turn? And here we are also reminded in later chapters of this book will confirm this of how brutal this opposition can be. Peter and John, did you notice, are let go only because they, the authorities were afraid of the people. But later they will go out preaching again, and the authorities will arrest them again. This time, Peter and John will be beaten in spite of the fact that the authorities are afraid of the people. And later, in chapter 7, the nastiness gets worse. Stephen is murdered. Christians are hunted down like animals. And all this happens, note, with the support of those in authority. For who is it that stands in opposition to the, uh, the apostles here? It is the group called the Sanhedrin. Who are the Sanhedrin? There's 70 elders, 72 if you count the priests and the former high priests that are both the religious and political authorities of the day. Under the Roman government, yes, but nevertheless, for the Jewish people, they are, they are the authority. These things should come as no shock to those of us who have read our Bibles. In the latter part of the book of Revelation, for example, we're told of a great dragon and this dragon is served by three beasts. And each of these beasts is in pursuit of the woman who has given birth to the man-child. Now I'm going to skip hours of exegesis and hours of explanation to say that the symbolic message is this. Satan is in pursuit of the church, and he uses three forces to that end. The arts, the entertainment, and culture of the day. The economic forces of the day. And those in authority, the government, all are used by the dragon to destroy the church and squelch the message of Jesus. They are his pawns, his tools to accomplish his mission. But it will not happen, for God will preserve his church in one day in this life or the next. Judgment will come in full force upon the powers of evil. But Christian, do not be surprised at opposition. Be ready for it, and do not be surprised when it becomes nasty. And what is more, do not be surprised if the opposition comes from not only religious people, but people who profess to be Christian. 
I'll give you one example and then I'll, we'll move on. An acquaintance of mine in another state recently preached a gospel sermon declaring the righteousness of Jesus Christ in which he decried the tendency of those in his own denomination to submit to and go along with, uh, dare I say, certain sexual practices which become, have become accepted today and not only accepted but promoted and not only promoted but shoved in our faces. And he had the courage to speak against that. Sitting in the pew of that same, was a pastor of that same denomination who was in, who was in support of this very ungodly movement. He was offended. He was offended. He tattled on the first pastor with the denominational higher-ups, and the first pastor was not chided, not rebuked, not instructed in private. He was fired immediately. Not by his local congregation, mind you. They loved him dearly, but by a church administrator who was not even present to hear the sermon. Man lost his job, lost his pension, lost his home, lost it all. All for speaking the truth in church. I think we call this being canceled. Don't be shocked at opposition from any direction and do not be shocked if it does not become violent. This is the world we live in, so how do we respond? Let me quickly say, and I have to say this as a point of clarification even though it does not come from the text, let me quickly say there is an important place for the Christian in the realm of politics. This could not happen in the time of Acts chapter 4. The apostles could not run for office. They don't vote. They could never be expected to uh, be elected to the Sanhedrin. They were totally at the mercy of the upper ruling class. But in these United States, brethren, in these United States, the founding fathers expected the likes of you and me to be learned, to be aware, and to be active in the political sphere. How did Lincoln put it? Of the people, by the people, for the people, by the way, where did he say that? Somebody tell me. Thank you. Thus I applaud all those who write letters, make phone calls, attend meetings, and even run for office. And this is why the freedom of the press is so important and why censorship is so dangerous. I'm not talking about drag queen hour when I say that. I'm talking about the fact that people have to have full access to complete and truthful information. This is the way our system here is designed to run. In another country, that may not be true. But we are expected to participate. And there's no better time than Memorial Day to remember that. Memorial Day weekend. We elect those who are to represent us. And we are to hold them accountable. To do our bidding. And to uphold the law in righteousness. And if we, they do not do that. It is our job to use all constitutional means to get them out of office. Not to sit back and let them run amok. That is not our system. To be a Christian today, we have to take our citizenship responsibilities seriously. But that is not the point of this passage. But I have to make that clear because it could be that some will say that politics is unimportant. Politics are important. But let us hasten to move on to say that 
politics is not the ultimate solution. And herein is another error. Politics is not our ultimate weapon. For just as there are those who have ignored politics, there are those who trust in it too much. If only we had more Republicrats in office, things would be the way they should be. If only we could get so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so. Uh, not so, not so. For see, brethren, the ultimate battle, as made plain from this passage, is not with flesh and blood, but it is spiritual. And it is a battle which takes spiritual weaponry. In the middle of verse 24, again, we read, Why do the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers again are gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city they are gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand in your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. There is so much here. But first, verses 25 and 26 spell out for us that the rage from the powers that be, be it culture, be it financial powers, be it the government, is actually a rage against God and his anointed servant, Jesus. We aren't the target. He is the target. I call attention again to the book of Revelation. Here's the big picture. First half of the book presents for us in symbolic form the persecution and pursuit of the church by the world. Why is this so? Why is there all this suffering and heartache and death? Why this hatred by the world? Second half of the book, because the outward onslaught of the world, uh, of the world on the church is the result of a deeper and more sinister and significant battle, and that is the battle between God and Satan. What we see here on the outside is merely an outward manifestation of a spiritual reality. And this unseen spiritual war, which have outward and physical manifestations on the er this earth, will continue until Jesus comes and crushes all his enemies under his feet. Brethren, we are not in the land of sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows, puppies, and unicorns. We are in the midst of of spiritual battle. And it is important for us to understand this, that ultimately it is not political, that it is spiritual. And to loosely quote John Piper, only when we understand that we are at war, spiritual war, will we be serious about prayer. It is for this reason, among others, that Paul, when laying the fundamental direction and priorities of the church to the young pastor tells us in 1 Timothy, I urge first of all, first of all what? That petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. I ask myself, as I ask you, to what degree have we really paid attention, prayerful attention, to what is going on in our world and praying about it? Are we praying for those who are in office? I do not think that it is without significance that Paul says in this passage, first of all, I think what he means by first of all is first of all. Pray for those in authority. Pray for those believers who hold political office, who are fighting tooth and nail the unrighteousness of this world. Stand by them. Support them. And pray that the ungodly may be removed from office. 
So we got it. Prayer, yeah. But what are we to pray? Here, perhaps, now that I'm on page 9 of my 12-page manuscript, we finally get to the meat of the sermon. We are given wise and godly counsel here through wise and godly examples. And among all the scriptural things we might pray for, this passage, did you notice, emphasizes two things. Request one, verse 29, grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Boldness, confidence, freedom, openness, clarity, freely, frankly. The specific word here even implies cheerfully. I know that there are those who will not like me speaking about Jesus in the public arena. We must not let this stop us, but instead pray for the opening, look for the opening, and then step forward on those occasions with words of truth. For the gospel is dynamic. It is the power of God into salvation for all who will believe. People need to hear the words coming out of our mouth. We know some will be offended, but let us remember that they were likely offended with Jesus beforehand. It's not us. It is only because they hated him that they respond the way to us the way they do. Don't let us stop us. Be bold. Don't let us stop. God, grant us grace to speak with kindness when needed, forthrightly when appropriate. I can be bold without being abrasive. I can be clear without being judgmental. I must be. For how can they call upon him whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone heralding, preaching the gospel? May it be me, even in a hostile culture. You say, I, I'm not a bold person. I don't know what to say. I'm not good enough. I might not say it right. Notice in our passage, the authorities observe that Peter and John were unlearned men. But they had been with Jesus. And there is our key, to be with Jesus. I will never travel all about Galilee and Jerusalem and all the other places that the disciples did. But I can still be at his feet. I can sit quietly in my chair or bed and read his word. I can gather with other Christians and listen and share. And I can come each Lord's Day consistently with hearts prepared to hear the word proclaimed. And in all these things and more, God will use these to increase my knowledge and strengthen me with boldness. And remember also as well, that, my friend, that it is not our cleverness which makes the difference. It's not exactly the specific words that are said. It is the Spirit of God. It is the Spirit that works in the heart. And God can use stumbling, fumbling lips coming from the likes of you and me. And thus God tells us, has told us through his servant Joshua, be strong and be bold. Banish fear and doubt. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Boldness boldness pray for boldness and second this weirds me out just a little bit <laughs> did you notice what they pray for they say verse 30 stretch your hand to heal with signs and wonders performed through the name of your holy servant jesus i think this is actually a point that i've missed in my christian life uh I'm called here to pray that God will show his divine power in extraordinary ways. We're not asking just for unusual happenings. We're asking 
Notice signs and wonders, that is, godly displays of God's power, which point people to Jesus. Unique displays of God's mighty hand, which will authenticate the gospel. I'm not sure we can be too specific about that. Maybe we can. I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure how they would manifest themselves. This might be left up to the Lord. But, And I must be careful not to simply ask for the extraordinary so that I uh, make my life easier to give me some sort of spiritual buzz. But instead, I'm asking, Lord, do a work which clearly point people to Jesus. Make it beyond question that this thing can only come from you. And one thing that certainly falls into this category is that people, as we boldly come to them and speak the name of Christ, that they come to Christ. For it is only God's spirit that can break the human heart. Only a work of God that can cause one to be born again. And I'll give you one instance of what I believe to be a sign and wonder. I, uh, uh, most of you know Marcia Davis, our former church secretary, now head of the Food Network. I've actually supplied her church called the uh, Gospel Baptist Tabernacle, which is not too far away from here, uh, three times since December. And after one service, I was introduced to one of the members. And he said, I've been saved, I don't remember how many, 20, 25 years, whatever it was that he said, I, I, don't, I don't recall. And um, he said, I was hooked on alcohol and rock cocaine. They say you can't get off that stuff. But I came to this church and I said, I need help. And they shared the gospel with me. And they prayed for me. And I got saved. And I've been clean ever since. That is a sign and wonder. And you know, brethren, the world can argue all it wants to about the church and the gospel and Christianity and point out the sins of the church. But I'll tell you one thing it can't do, the world can't do. It can't do that. It doesn't do that. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we are bold and we ask God to show his hand, to work his signs and wonders. I need to quickly close. I said a lot of things that may have scared some of you. <laughs> and so I got I to gotta, I gotta add this. Uh, notice verse 28. All the stuff that had happened, they said, it only happened because your hand and plan had predestined it to take place. Even the opposition working all to the counsel of his will. Brethren, I, I don't know where we're heading in this country. But I do know nothing will happen apart from his hand. All is not lost. God will have the ultimate victory. Our job is not to save our nation. I hope he does. But it is to be faithful, to be bold, and to be agents of his wonders and power. Let us pray. God of grace and God of glory. On your people, pour your power. Crown your ancient church's story. Bring its bud to glorious flower. Grant us wisdom. Grant us courage. For the facing of this hour. 
Yes, grant us faith and courage and wisdom for the facing of this hour. In Jesus' name, amen.